Hello students, this is my attempt at recording our lecture for Wednesday, February 17th. This will likely be two videos on YouTube because of the size limitation on that platform. So please be sure to check out the second part of this video. I want to take a moment and just thank you for your flexibility and your well wishes and your prayers as I um, deal with this injury. It's been quite a challenge and I really appreciate the uh, support and prayers that you all have given me. I'm not sure if I'll be there on Wednesday yet or not. Um, I'm just kind of taking it day by day here. But please do take a look at these videos and um, we'll try to keep up as best that we can. Thank you again for your flexibility. Today we're going to be finishing some work on chapter five. Chapter five dealt with the zoogeography and biogeography. Those were issues that were on your exam. So I'm gonna to touch on those briefly and then we're gonna move on to chapter 12. So by now everybody has done the exam and um, I'll, I will get those graded eventually. Um, I will need your patience with that as well. Um, hopefully you found it um, entertaining if nothing else. So I actually wrote that before the injury, so I can't blame that on pain medications. I was really trying to stress the, the applied nature of some of these questions. So some of those things like the type of bone that a marsupial has or principles of parsimony, um, I think those are important, but I wanna put those into some sort of, of applied framework for you. And that, that was the nature of those questions there. So while they were uh, humorous, um, hopefully you can see that you know, with a little bit of imagination, you can see how some of these issues can actually be applied. We're skipping over chapter 11 in your book. That is um, a group of animals that you're never going to encounter. Uh, we're moving instead to chapter 12, which we'll talk about today, which are elephants and hyraxes and um, the manatees. Those are things that are good to be familiar with, even though you're probably not gonna encounter those either, but they're ones that people are familiar with, so it's, it's good to be familiar with them because of that. So I'm gonna start with just a quick overview of the zoogeography or biogeography. We'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, there are the, the different zones or regions that zoogeography is gonna divide the planet up into. And these are animals that have similar flora and fauna. Um, they have the areas that have a lot of similarities between the two typically have some sort of corridors or something that has connected them and allowed animals to move back and forth. Whereas those that have um, lots of endemic species are often areas that have been relatively isolated from other parts of the globe. One thing I want to, to stress uh, a lot with the zoogeography is that the way that the world is now doesn't did not necessarily influence the distribution of species that we see now. So a lot of the species distribution and the species richness is an artifact of historical events that have impeded animal movements or restricted animal movements and has caused some increased diversity because of that. So an example of that is if you look at the United States and you look at species richness or, or biodiversity of mammals in the United States, uh, if you look along the, the mountainous region of our country, we have a lot more biodiversity in those areas than we do where we're at or in those areas that have been heavily glaciated and that is because of the impact of glaciers over time as glaciers move through an area like minnesota it kind of wiped out all the animals and then uh, as a glacier retreated some animals came back in when glaciers move through areas that have a lot of topographic relief um, it would move animals up and down mountains and would strand them on mountains and then they would end up being isolated from each other and then cause speciation because they're isolated. So the main reason we see such increased biodiversity along our mountainous regions is because of that topographic relief that we have in the mountainous regions. 
There are a few general rules with this. Uh, species richness generally increases as you move towards the tropics. These are areas that are were impacted by some of the um, historic climate change, but weren't completely um, reshaped each time that we had a glacier come through. So there were little pockets of rainforest and pockets of mountains and things in the tropical areas, and that increases, spe increases species richness. Again, uh, we have topographic relief. You have more species richness. Um, this is because you, you have different types of habitat and animals that were stranded in different types of habitats that um, speciated. When you look at peninsulas, like if you look at Florida, for example, um, historically you have lower species richness in those areas. And those, that's because those are areas that are inundated with water, um, which limited mammals and mammal diversity in those areas. So at one point, Florida was underwater, then it came above water and was underwater. That is going to decrease species richness compared to an area like Costa Rica, where there's mountains and it's warm and um, it never, was, never went completely underwater. The lateral gradient in species diversity has been pretty well described in North and South America. Um, not so much in other parts of the world, but here has been fairly well described. And there are competing reasons that uh, people believe that we have have this um, that all relate to those things that we just talked about, about uh, his historic effect of glaciers, refugia as water rose and, and, and um, water went away through different ice ages, um, refugia of tropical forest that creates sort of this series of islands of habitat that results in speciations. This is sort of the competing, uh, the competing theory as to why we have more species uh, closer to the equator and then less species as we move away. All of these concepts relate to the theory of island biogeography. Those of you that have taken ecology or are taking ecology are going to become pretty familiar with this. And it's really fairly intuitive. If you think of the relationship between the number of species and some of the characteristics of an island, um, these relationships seem pretty intuitive. So the larger the island is, the more species you're going to have. If you have a really big island like Australia, that's going to have a whole lot more species than St. Croix in the Caribbean, um, just because there's more types of habitats on, on those islands. The for more an island is isolated, the less species it has also. So if you have a, a little island um, that's out in the middle of nowhere, like Fiji, that island does not have a whole lot of, of species diversity because it's just harder for animals to get to that island. There are less land bridges, um, less um, sort of these sweepstake events where animals could have made it to these, these little islands. That results in a lower number of animals out there. So island, bio, island biogeography is important, but it's important to think of it beyond just islands. So an island can be a little island, but it can also be a pocket of habitat. You can have an island that is um, a area of deciduous woods that is surrounded by prairies. You could have an island of tundra type habitat or alpine type habitat that's on these mountain tops throughout a mountain range that essentially are like islands because they're isolated from each other. So island biogeography relates to islands, but it relates to islands of habitat as well. The area effects and distance effects that we see in island biogeography relate to species diversity through immigration and extinction rates also. So islands, whether it's an island habitat or an actual island, um, islands that are relatively large have a lower probability of extinction events versus small islands. And um, similarly, uh, islands that are far away versus close islands. And this, again, makes intuitive sense. So if you have something like a hurricane come through, and uh, cause a catastrophic, catastrophic event that wipes out an island. Um, it has a much bigger and more profound effect on a small island than it does a large island. 
So the probability of extinction is going to be higher because of that. Um, similarly, the distance, um, how isolated that island is, is going to have some impact because if a if something like that does happen, a hurricane comes through and wipes it out, or a forest fire, or a volcano, or whatever, uh, if it's isolated and far away from any other animals, it's much less likely to be colonized again. So the area of an island and the distance of an island affects the probability of extinction and the probability of colonization as well. So if we're going to break that down very simply, um, large close islands have the most species, and that's because immigration is high, there's more habitat there, and the risk of extinction is low. And then um, large distant islands or small close islands would be somewhere in the middle. And those small islands that are distant and very isolated and far away from anything else are going to have the fewest species. Um, take a moment and just think about this because I think uh, when you give it a little bit of thought, it becomes very intuitive that this makes a lot of sense. An early zoogeographer is uh, this scientist named Wallace who divided the globe into these um, six biogeographic regions. And um, I, I just want to mention him. I don't think it's terribly important, but I want to mention him in case you ever hear about him. So the idea here was that you could make these um, longitudinal bands across the globe, and those bands that are closer to the equator have more uh, biodiversity than those that are further away. And by and large, this, this rule makes sense. 